uh, after sports, we're back. And uh, I'm looking forward to the U.S. Open. No doubt. No yeah. doubt. Uh, yeah, I've got to tell you, though, I mean, today we've got quite a, quite a packed show. We want to talk about a number of important things. Yeah. The former president, John Romani Mahama, was on Facebook Live yesterday. A number of people asked him some questions. He took the opportunity to answer uh, some very interesting uh, issues that were brought up uh, when he went interactive uh, with the public via Facebook in that Q&A. Uh, later, by the way, we'll be talking about the latest uh, action taken by the government in, the, in regards to the Don't Call Me Contracts for Sale uh, documentary that was put together by Manasa Zirawini. Uh, he has suspended the PPA boss and referred the case to Shiraj and the public uh, prosecutor, special prosecutor. So we will talk about that and get some reactions from the uh, integrity landscape, if you will, <laughs> anti-corruption uh, NGOs. We'll do that in a bit. But first, first, um, let's talk about what um, the former president had to say yeah. when uh, questions were thrown at him. Wait, did you watch the Facebook? Yes, I, I, I watch. Um, I, I, I watch the most part, not mm. all of it. And and relatedly, uh, he spoke about the issues on banking. Uh, and for me, as somebody who practices uh, the profession, I, I thought also. Um, his point on the closure of the radio stations and, and how that impinges on, on the fundamental uh, rights of persons practicing journalism, mm. but also um, the, the whole right about free speech and the way the trend has been under the Kufuado administration. I thought that was also a case in point that we all needed to deliberate about. But I, 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 I think overall, that interaction was great. It was a great interaction. I was surprised that... Um, at the end of the day, during the Q&A, he had a lot of questions to answer. Yeah. So it also means that he had the attention of, course. Um, of the people yeah. who were on social media. You know, um, the, the first time I saw the, the thing, I went to like his page quickly because mm -hmm. I then was not on his page. Mm. I, don't know, I think I saw your name or a couple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I follow them all. Yeah. So, so as a result of that, uh, then I put, I, I, my phone led me to have it on my calendar. So mm -hmm. when the time was up, I got a reminder. So I had to go onto Facebook, and, and, I, and I thought it was a great one. Yeah. It, it got me thinking, though, whether uh, in 10 years' time we'll still be going live and hmm. rather not pick it, and whether I will be losing my job and somebody will not be doing <laughs> broadcasts on Facebook. <laughs> you know. Well, I think uh, <laughs> the, the reason why our job remains relevant is because of the way we represent the people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, true. If, um, yeah, yeah, if people yeah. Co uh, can their own content and present it, then they can present it to their <laughs> benefit. And uh, you, the people, will not get represented. Definitely. So, yeah, but that was fascinating stuff. Let's, um, let's, let's capture a bit of what he said. Later, we'll talk about what he also said about the former... Uh, the, uh, former about the vice president's um, uh, characterization of him. Yeah, yeah. But we'll get to that. First, the, uh, the banking sector was a big issue that came up in the discussion. Let's see what the former president had to say about this government's cleanup of the banking sector. The developments in the banking and financial system and the matters arising call for great concern for all who have been affected by this financial sector turmoil, especially because it is an issue that threatens our country's national security. We must all be worried about the businesses that have collapsed, the licenses that have been revoked, the massive job losses, the hardship this is causing to some customers, and the trauma of having their lifetime savings in jeopardy. There's also the consequence on the health and well-being of customers and workers including honoring their obligations as parents by providing for their families and dependents, paying school fees of their wards, and paying rent in order to give their families decent and safe places to lay their heads among others. These are trying times indeed, and as a leader of the main opposition party, I cannot look on and consent. We cannot look on without our voices being heard and without being on the side of the many people who may be agonizing over the situation because they have lost their capital investments, they've lost their lifetime savings, their jobs, their businesses, or the fear that their deposits are in jeopardy and are therefore uncertain about their future and that of their families. Those who have been hardest hit by these unfortunate developments 
include especially market women, artisans, cocoa farmers, and the many operators in the informal sector of the economy whose hard work and yet modest earnings oil the wheels of our national economy. In all, it is estimated that more than 20,000 people have already lost their jobs as a result of the financial sector shutdowns. The number could be even higher when you take into account the indirect job losses occasioned by this crisis. Apart from the livelihoods lost, the resolution cost of nearly 20 billion Ghana CDs, as we are told, ultimately becomes a burden on the Ghanaian taxpayer. Yeah, talking about the banking sector. Yes, there. yes, definitely. And mm. we all know that the decision taken by the Bank of Ghana, of course, is backed by government, the Ministry of Finance, um, was long overdue. Uh, I have had commentary uh, since then, uh, and also because of the action that had been taken by the Bank of Ghana when he was president. Mm. It also gave us all the indication that it's not as if it's a crisis that started today. It was something that was impending. Mm, the point of resolution is which actions were taken. That should have also been taken at the time mm. that they should have been taken. And, and, and it was something that was inevitable, I should yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 for me, what he said was only the opening of a discussion. Yeah. He yeah. hasn't really resolved the issue about what, what, you know, what irregularities were going on while he was president mm. and whether or not he, he bears some responsibility for the fact that it got this bad. Anyway. But, but, but what, is, what, what is also noticeable is that uh, even or despite what everybody may say, this is a national security issue, uh, just like he classified Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Because for people, the larger section of the working population within that sector and the value chain that tend to depend on the banks losing their jobs, livelihoods and families will be yeah. affected. Yeah. And it creates some level of instability yeah. uh, in communities. The the larger part people of still country. can't access some of their deposits with oh, CBG. That's even for just for the is latter it? part. Yeah, but it's yeah. still a, it's a big problem. Perhaps even bigger than the unemployment that exactly. has been caused by Exactly. Them. I do agree. Yeah. All right. Okay, then uh, he took some time to talk about roads. As you know, everybody's talking about the state of roads in Ghana. He had something to say about it. Also, he added a reason why he wants to be president again. Um, Hamida Abdul Wahabi asked, please, what measures will you put in place to facilitate the construction of deplorable commercial roads linking farming communities? I believe that our road network carries the bulk of our transportation. It indeed is the bulwark of our transportation because if you compare, if you compare it to rail and aviation and maritime, then the road network is the most used in our country. And so it's important that we have roads that are able to facilitate the movement of passengers and goods across our country. Realizing that we did not have enough money in the budget to finance the road sector. We decided in the Energy Sector Levy Act to increase the amount of money that went to the road fund. And as I speak, that uh, provision makes about 1.5 billion CDs available to government every year to not only maintain the roads, but to develop new roads. Aside from that, we introduced the Cocoa Roads Improvement Project. And that was supposed to take a part of the yearly consortium financing for cocoa to develop and repair the roads in the five cocoa growing regions. And I'm sure that everywhere, everybody in the country saw some improvement in their roads you know, during the period that I was president. I think that we can revive these projects. A lot of the projects had contractors working on them. And the point you need to know is that Contractors do not finish a project in one year. And so they present certificates, and as they present certificates, government continues to pay. And so I believe that if government organizes itself properly, it should be able to continue to work on our roads and improve them so that we have a good road network that not only transports agricultural products, but also makes it possible for passengers and goods to move freely across our country. Um, Salia Abdullah is asking why he should choose me 
of an anado? Will I run a better economy and take better decisions to benefit our people? I believe that every government faces its challenges. I faced my challenges. I faced a legacy problem um, of the energy sector where we do not have enough generation. We were consuming in excess of 2,000 megawatts, and yet the generation available to Ghanaians was less than 2,000, it was 1,500 megawatts. I did not push the blame to past governments. I took the bull by the horns. Every government, a president must take responsibility. And I said, I'll solve the problem. And indeed, we went to work, and by 2016, we had put in enough generation so that for those who remember, in 2016, Dumso had been uh, completely sorted out. There were other challenges with the economy, and I found it necessary as leader to take a decision to go back to the IMF and do a program so that we could bring some discipline into the management of our finances. And for those who will remember, by 2016, this economy was climbing out of the macroeconomic challenges that we had faced. One of the decisions I took was to fast track our revenues from oil. Isn't that interesting? I mean, he talks about why we went for an IMF program. And today, what he says is that it was to bring some discipline. Do you remember how, how strong they went on the message that it was for policy credibility? We already knew what we were doing. We just needed a big brother with international clout to say, oh, what they are doing is right, so that the international markets would respond favorably to us. Now it was for discipline. Mm -hmm. So we were not disciplined. We had to go to IMF for discipline. Um, um, and, and we all do know how, how that all started. The thing is that at the end of the financial year, the fiscal year 2012, we had, uh, by the time we got to 2013, uh, 2013, got to know that uh, we had a... Did you say 2013? 2013. <laughs> we, we, we had gotten um, a, a deficit of our budget, run it um, nearly 12%, or just in excess of 12%. Mm. That followed through 2013, 2014, 2015, and then we had to go to the IMA because we couldn't just show up. Uh, the trading balances were there, the surpluses just were not working, and the reserves also were not good. Yeah. And um, the Britain Wood institutions were on our neck. So yeah. it's, not as if, it's not as if that it was a, a decision that was voluntary. It was out of compulsion. Yeah. <laughs> so but you know, it's so funny. we have to be specific. It, it, it's one decisions. of the decisions that was made under the Mahama government that was just so hypocritical. I think it was so obvious that what they were saying wasn't the case. For example, uh, it was, this was in 2014, right? So earlier in the year, they had come out with this very strange policy around February, March, that um, you, know, you couldn't uh, charge dollars for anything. They, they said that would be the solution to the problem uh, of the depreciating city. Didn't work. It didn't work. They had to uh, you know, turn the decision around, which is fine. If you try something that doesn't work, you, you, you should be bold enough to you know, change, change course. But then... They, um, they, they went to St. Chief and said, okay, we, we don't know what we are doing, so you come and tell us what we should do. And the NPP obviously didn't participate in that, whether it's because they didn't know either what to do or for whatever reason. They didn't go there. They said they weren't invited on time or something funny like that. But basically, they said, okay, you come and tell us what we should do. At the end of that, there was a, 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 a communique or a way forward that said nothing about the IMF. Nothing in there mentioned the IMF. But months later, we were in the IMF. So it's like three different separate de massive decisions which were all touted as solutions didn't work, and we ended up in the IMF. And when we got there, we said, oh, we are here because we know what we are doing. We are just coming here for them to give us policy credibility. It was so hypocritical. But anyway, I hope somebody learned from that. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about... Um, this, this new way of communicating uh, that has been uh, adopted by the um, former president. It's, a, it's not a new way. Facebook Live has been around for a long time. But being used at this level by a, a presidential candidate is, uh, is new. Let's, uh, let's talk to Kobi Mensah. Dr. Kobi Mensah is a political marketer. He's a lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. Uh, he's also an APSU, so... Uh, he's in mourning this, 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 uh, this morning uh, following the loss of Junior Agogo. Uh, Dr. Mensah, how nice to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And you're right, uh, the Apsu family is actually in mourning. 
and uh, we joined the families of Junior Kobe. You know, he was my senior by one year. Fantastic yeah. guy. Mm, that's true. All right, now um, let's let's talk about this uh, Facebook Live. Uh, Roland made an interesting comment earlier that uh, is this the advent of the the end of um, journalists attending uh, news conferences? Has the, the uh, former president stumbled upon a more organic way of interacting with uh, his, uh, shall we call them for now, constituents? Well, uh, of course, it's uh, one of the, you know, fundamentally, you know, uh, changing you know, uh, structure to political communication. And mm. I remember, you know, way down the line, Tony Blair had his big conversation, you know, on Facebook, where he actually takes, you know, uh, I mean, uh, questions from, from, from the constituents, from the citizens, and then it was, it was big news out there. Of course, we thought that he was going to do away with the press conferences, et cetera, you know, with traditional media, it didn't. I mean, so suddenly it's one of the, you know, uh, great ways for a political candidate to sort of uh, remove or eliminate the issue of controls that we, we have in traditional, you know, uh, media, traditional uh, political communications. Like the agenda setting, we always say that the journalist or, you know, other, you know, players will set the agenda for you or like the gatekeeping. But of course, you know, it would not actually take journalism or the traditional uh, media away. No, it was amazing. It was uh, fascinating, you know, looking at it and the way the president, the former president, sorry, actually had absolute control, you know, of his own thoughts and then supply the answers that people needed. I think that was a great way. Um, if you do an, a content analysis of what was said from beginning to end, has the president in any way furthered our knowledge of, uh, you know, his thought processes? Has he given us any new information? Um, has he given us any insights uh, into aspects of, of his, uh, you know, his, his plan for the future that we didn't know before? Do, are, are we more informed following this, uh, this event? Yeah, I suppose so, because uh, obviously, you know, when uh, you're in presidency, uh, you have a lot more things that you can't say. Now, here's the case that we saw someone who is absolutely free to discuss what he thinks. Mm -hmm. And I think that he had, uh, again, the, the, the ability or he had the, the room to actually position the narrative in a differently in terms of the financial cleanup as the government would term it. Mm -hmm. But of course, he thought that the idea of cleanup was actually the chaotic one, you know, and therefore they could actually resort to entirely different processes before the the so-called cleanup you know could be thought about because that would have been the the final final thing if nothing actually had worked mm. so yes it's it sort of uh, he was in his own element you know he didn't actually have the usual kind of baggage that the president would have like like nanado would have mm. you know he, he spoke freely just like every other citizens you know would do and I think that that was that was refreshing because he didn't have the usual, you know, barriers that you know if you're in a in a position of power, you would have and you wouldn't say. I mean, you made reference to the idea that he told the country that they were going to IMF just because they wanted you know some kind of discipline. But when they were taking the decisions at the time, they presented something different. Of course, when I when you are in in in, in power, when you are in power a uh, position of authority. There's not everything that you can actually say to the people because you want to be mindful of how it can trigger fear, how it can trigger, you know, sense of uncertainty. And as he mentioned it, you know, the central bank earlier on had made certain pronouncements and had actually kind of uh, uh, threatened or had actually put the, the financial sector in a very uncertain, unstable Manner and therefore the rundown as we can see. So there are certain things that actually prevent, you know, uh, people in power, you know, from not saying the, 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 the truth or not actually being forthright, you know, with a, with a citizenship. Mm. Um, now let's talk about the audience. Uh, you know, he was on Facebook, so this is a global audience. But of course, the ones that he cared most about would be the ones who can vote. So uh, what do we know about the Ghanaian audience on mm -hmm. Facebook? Uh, how are they split up? Uh, 
what, what, in essence, was he preaching to the choir? Was he talking to people who predominantly uh, are inclined towards him anyway? Or did he have a job of having to convince people to his way of thinking? Yeah, I think he, he actually had a job to convince people. And I, I did a sentiment analysis. I used a tool, you know, uh, a, a tool, a social media analytic tool to look at it because I was myself following the, the thread and following the handles to check whether, you know, those who are actually posing the questions are, as we, we call them, opportune witnesses or uh, mm. they are people who are genuinely, you know, putting across their questions and then asking uh, the right questions. And when I did that, in fact, the users and then the people who are actually asking questions were random you know, mm. which I, I felt refreshing. And the questions were actually deep. I mean, they were very, you know, you would say relevant questions. And he also is sort of, he came across as genuinely responding to them, you know, without any time limitations, without any time restrictions, or being having a, a pre-selected kind of, a, a, you know, questionnaires. So I, I found that it was, it was refreshing. So yes, definitely he spoke to you know Ghanaians you know much more uh, clearly. Now I, I think that also that uh, the idea that people would have the time because I saw you know the viewership at the time was almost five thousand during the live you yeah. know conversation. Of course, after that it went to almost about seventy eight thousand plus. You know you had, mm. you had almost four thousand questions. And you had about you know a thousand point six you know, uh, shares. That, no. you know, that's a you know, to be on this channel. Quite a lot of media houses, and I'm sure that their shares, when it comes to interaction with the people, wouldn't go as much as we had, I mean, in terms of uh, the, the numbers yeah. that we could see on there. So that's quite an improvement, you know. But of course, a lot of times people will still resort to traditional media for credibility and for other things, you know, not necessarily Facebook or social media taking over. So I think that yes, Ghanaians have actually embraced technology, and we are becoming, I would use the cliche, sophisticated in our political communication, the consumption of political you know, messages, et cetera, and people were asking the tough questions that needed you know, to be asked. And I think I was impressed by that. Mm. Now, of course, uh, as a political marketer, and I think I can confidently ask you this question. Unfortunately, in Ghana, we don't really have polls um, that we can uh, resort to at, <clears throat> at the end of any given political event to see whether someone's ratings have gone up or down. But you study that sort mm -hmm. of uh, landscape. And uh, what would your professional opinion be as a, a former president uh, raised his profile and increased his chances or, or uh, gone down or does he remain exactly where he was? I think he has raised his profile. I mean, uh, as I said, I did a sentiment analysis and checked, you know, the, the sentiment. You know, at some point it was seven to, seven to one, which means the positive, you know, was seven to one. Obviously, these tools actually use what we call natural language processing and other things. So you may not necessarily be able to de de determine it unless you put it to further you know, analysis. Right. But if we have to use that same value, you know, you would say that his profile perhaps has gone down. Of course, it may not be you know, as a result of one thing, maybe his performance on this, uh, uh, what he did yesterday. It could also be, be that people are not happy with the existing or with the current you know, uh, government, uh, government and therefore are expressing or venting their anger you know, with you know, the president, you know, the former president coming to speak to us. Mm -hmm. there, there could be so many variables you know, that could actually explain why you know we're seeing sort of a, a jolt in his appearance in his thoughts but i think that speaking to Ghanaians is not only enough you know it's not enough you know for him to convince people that they have changed i think that it depends largely on his inner caucus you know people are eager to know who's going to be his vice candidate yeah. people are eager to know who's going to be his shadow financial you know a, a, what do you call minister for finance the people are eager to know who the president surrounds himself with. I think that's the most important. You know, speaking to people, we can always say that that's what politicians do. They speak. They speak the right words. They speak the right language. When they're not in position and when they come in position, it's completely different. And I'm sure yeah. people haven't really, you know, forgotten about that, although they actually chastise him 
the current administration, they are also very much aware of your own, you know, lapses, you know, when you're in government. So for me, I think that the crucial test or the litmus test for them is to assemble a front line that is believable, that is credit, uh, credit, credible, and that could actually inject confidence in people and to say that, yes, when we thrust the government into your hands, we believe that you could do the, do the right thing. And you know, we have to actually you know, think about putting politicians on their toes. We have mm. to question every move that they make. We don't have to actually listen to whatever they say and take it as the truth. No. So I think that we're actually watching the moves that he makes in bringing people around him. Who will be those going to be in the inner caucuses? And I think that is what will be the defining factor, whether people will believe him or they will not believe him. Mm. Uh, Dr. Mensah, I want to thank you very much for your time with us. That was very insightful. We appreciate you as always. Right, there you go. That's Dr. Kobe Mensah. He's a political marketer at the, and a lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. But uh, very interesting there, Roland, how he uh, analyzes the audience to which the president was speaking. He thinks the president has, uh, former president has um, uh, enhanced his profile, um, that he now will have more people on his side than before he did, he did this uh, Facebook Live. Uh, but the, 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 the audience on Facebook or on social media in general, in Ghana, was always thought to be more NPP. Yes, and, if it, and even if you take um, the two personalities, the current president, um, Nane Dodankwe Kufado, and himself, and, and you tend to look at the likes uh, for their official public pages. Yeah. Um, he has 1.1 million in excess, mm -hmm. and Nanado Dankwe Kufa, the president, has 1.6 mm. million in excess. Right. Okay. And then if you do an aggregation uh, of what the statistics have been over the last two years for social media, particularly on Facebook, the, the most um, utilized is WhatsApp, mm -hmm. most utilized. Yeah. But those that tend also um, to appear on Facebook every day, averagely for Accra, 4 million and then uh, in excess of two million for Kumasi, mm -hmm. and the rest dwindle yeah. down, down the As pecking order. Mm. Now, ultimately, it will tell you you have 1.6, 1.0. And, and if, you, if you see the way social media has become a strategic tool for public figures, for p creating public opinion, and also disseminating information, mm. you have an aggregation of people who like you and who don't like you. They are there, one, to come and see what you're doing, to come also to contribute either negatively or positively for their cause or for your cause. Mm. Now, it will be, I think, uh, fruitful if you have, in his case, more people against you who would rather come and see what you want to and hear what you want to do. Mm. And, and it will depend on the content you generate, etc. And how that sort of engagement ultimately will convince them or not and dissuade their minds. Uh, differently from the initial intentions for which they decided yeah. to come and join you. And, and I, I think this is innovative. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's also the best way to uh, get to know about the population that usually is very youthful. Yeah. Uh, they have a certain direction in the boardroom uh, because you have corporate people, yeah. people like you, etc., yeah. who would always tend to contribute. So they'll, they'll, tr they'll hear you. It's better you are in the face than yeah. not in their face at all. Indeed. It, yeah. The strategy will work. It has to be consistent. Yeah. But it cannot be isolated, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good tool going forward. But um, uh, it, there is also a certain mirage that social media creates. And politicians have to be aware of it. Sometimes when you're having a discussion on social media, you think you're having a national discussion. You think you're talking to the whole nation. But a recent study by CNN said that only 9% of Ghanaians are online. Only 9%. All right. so and it's also because uh, of many other related a mm. a access to the internet, Absolutely. access to data even when you have the internet, and then and the technology to access to having yeah. the tool so, that will so, make you. So you, you yeah. really, it's a mirage, you know, and uh, you have to be conscious of it as a politician that you're not really talking to the whole mm. nation. All right then. Well, um, it, Dear AM comes up next. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh, this is one of the things I really missed when I was out on the road. Um, but uh, let, me, let me ask you this. How old is your wife? So we're doing, oh, I, I was going to stop you from saying it out loud. Okay, fine. So, and you know this for a fact? You've seen like her birth certificate before? Yeah, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. All right. Look, you are in the majority. You are in the majority. Most I'm people, 
haven't uh, haven't subjected. I mean, come to think of it, I've seen a passport. Okay. Oh yeah, uh, yeah so. but I mean. So yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that the best MTK is used when preparing the passport. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Guru Boys. So you're assuming that my wife Guru is Guru Boys are also used. No, but what I'm saying is that most of us have taken what our spouses have told us about their age. We've taken it on face value. We trust them, and so we believe them. Well, um, the next problem we're going to try and solve together with the viewer uh, is, is from, from one, of, one of us whose wife lied about her age. She said she was one year younger than him. Turns out she's seven years older. And partly, uh, this is partly the reason why they have been unable to have children for a long time. Well, guess what this man decided to do about it? All of that and more when we come back.